Patanjali is uh, is the author of this classical yoga system, which is no matter almost um, any system that you'll be exposed to will reference back to this these basic rules. Um, there's not so much rules as disciplines, um, but I guess try to differentiate between that. So you, as you will have been exposed up until now, probably, yogic people can, uh, can sometimes be very, very strict with the way that they live, the things that they eat, um, the things that they do and don't do, and uh, that generally comes from this. So it can be taken in various different ways in the tantric tradition. Of course, we also observe this, but it's a, it's a little, um, we're not so much about um, abstaining from things in life as uh, seeing the beauty and the pleasure in everything. So it's, that's why I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll start at the beginning. So there's, uh, so if you look at the tree, it's sort of a tree, a flowery tree. Um, the basis for the tree of yoga, the eight limbs, is this thing called ya yama and niyama. And uh, yama, as a reference, yama is the god of death. So yama is really the recommendations of things that are not so useful to being on a spiritual path and progressing in the, in the, in the yogic, living in a yogic way. So the yama um, is on the left and then the niyamas are on the right and they expand out by five of each. In uh, the tantric t tradition they expand out by another five on each so there's ten of each but this is the classical system. We don't have time to go into all of that philosophy. And you'll see that number one of the don'ts is ahimsa. Who knows what ahimsa is? Yeah, it's written on the page. Yeah, even with your glasses on. In some violence, in action, thought, creation. Yeah. So it's non-violence. That's a, that's um, kind of the traditional way that we translate it, or do no harm. So unfortunately, we do harm to ourselves in so many different ways. Um, and I would say, I would dare say, in fact, it's something Anik asked me this morning and about the, what was the major change for me after doing the Panchakarma. I went away and thought about it a little more and it was really shifting negative thinking. Mm. That was the biggest for me. I was brought up with two parents that are uh, naturally pessimistic and see the worst in things first. Uh, they were still good parents, mm. but that's their mm. style or that's from their upbringings, I guess. And so uh, much of my 20s was, um, you know, seeing things in maybe a negative light first. So definitely, um, you know, at 35, doing this Panchakarma and cleansing out and learning all of these uh, positive mantras that create positive energy in your body and doing lots of fire ceremonies and letting go of negative things, both through the purging of the body and attending the ceremonies. It was really negative thinking that has shifted the most for me. And um, becoming aware first that I was thinking in that way of my patterns and where they'd come from and then, and then over the years working on it. And of course it's always an ongoing practice. But yeah, that's probably the biggest thing that I kind of thought of afterwards. Um, so nonviolence is the main reason why a yogis are vegetarian. So why would we need to kill something else in order for us to survive? That's the mentality. Um, I, I believe it's a personal choice, but it should be a conscious choice, like anything else. So yes, the first, so the, the first two of the fir um, the first two of the yamas are sort of the, the guiding principles. If you weren't to learn anything else, the first two are the most important. And so the first one being nonviolence, particularly noticing your thinking, which is why we're doing all these things like learning to write out what we're thinking. We'll also do a little exercise where we'll close our eyes and start to just speak it and start to be able to speak our truth a bit more. Um, not in the full group, just with one other person. But um, so ahimsa, doing no harm. You can These are yours, so you write notes on them.
And then uh, Simon Borg Olivier, who's an Australian yoga teacher, he's a kind of an older, very experienced yoga teacher. And um, he's also an amazing physical yogi, but he has a really good grasp of all the philosophy. And he, I've given his translation on this page because I really like it, because he puts it in the positive frame. And so instead of being violent, we're gentle. So being gentle with ourselves, being gentle with our thoughts, being gentle when we notice that we're thinking negatively and that we've just judged that person and ourselves or whatever. Gently recognizing and maybe writing it down to get it out of our heads or burning it, all of those things. So number one, non-violence, do no harm. Number two, satya, truthfulness. It's super, super important if we want to transform in life that we're honest with ourselves. Honest with each other in a gentle and kind way without harming the other person, but being truthful. And sometimes, um, sometimes telling the truth is not, a, it's, well, I would say oftentimes it's not an easy thing to do, um, particularly identifying things that are holding you back from living your most vital, radiant life. You know? When you see things that you're not really, um, that are holding you back, it can be really confronting. So to be gentle with that process. I won't spend too long because we have a lot to go through, but we can always talk about different things over dinners and lunches and breakfasts. <laughs> Aspects, <silence>. yeah, <laughs> if we're not sitting at the silent table. <laughs> yeah, so the next one is Asteya. Oh, and so uh, his Simon's uh, translation for truthfulness is balanced. So if we're being truthful, we're, we're giving things in a balanced way. A stay a non-stealing. So this is kind of in many different ways. It can be, um, the yoga teachers can help me out. It can be with time, you know, not taking up other people's time. It can be, um, obviously, the literal, not taking other people's things. Energy. 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 Yeah, Energy. not dumping on people, yeah. you know, um, sort of being truthful with, with yourself. Yes, I've got a problem, I need to deal with it. Going to the person and dealing with, with yourself, dealing with it with you and them rather than this, um, this thing we do as women and go behind people's backs and talk about things and energize them and make them much bigger than they need to be in order to, um, to get them off our chest. So writing them down finding other ways that are, that are more gentle with yourself and others. Um, yeah, that's kind of the gist of Asteya. Um, so if we're not stealing, we're giving. So we, we're sort of trying to turn, shift our perception into well, what can I offer this situation? Perhaps it's just my ear. Perhaps I don't need to say anything. Perhaps Danny just needs to get off her chest what she needs to say and I just need to listen. No, I don't need to add commentary to, to it. I'm just there to hold space for her. We'll practice doing that for each other. Brahmacharya is um, traditionally, traditionally all yogis are celibate. So because of the, the vital energies that we remember in the beginning um, <laughs> class, <laughs> that's the, those squirrel looking things. Yeah, I just saw one jump in the tree. Um, we remember the energy that was in the base, and then we're trying to move it up. You'll learn about shaktis and how shaktis, the female energy, just gets distracted all the time, which is what we're training. <laughs> so back with me, please. <laughs> back with me. <laughs> so traditionally celibate. Um, and uh, that the reason for that being that they want to uh, keep that vital energy which is in the sexual organs and maintain it for themselves uh, to lift the energy to use it for enlightenment experiences to try and awaken so uh, rather than spread the seed around and dissipate the energy they want to contain it so that's why they're celibate but it goes wrong in a lot of guru traditions as you would have heard so uh, also in tantra it's not belief that we have. Um, the next one, Aparigraha. <laughs> this is massive. Um, 
living in the world that we live in. A parigraha is, is um, non-grasping, you know, this, this need that we have for stuff and having things and accumulating and desiring and needing more and needing chocolate and needing a glass of wine to relax and everything else under the sun is um, it's a constant it's a constant snowball that's never going to end so it's this so we're looking for in yoga this idea of a freedom from that desire that well actually we're already enough in ourselves it doesn't really matter what I wear or what I eat if it's something's put in front of me because I'm already enough I, I'm not looking outside of myself to fill myself up I'm not looking to go to the shops to buy a dress that's going to make me feel good when I put it on because I already feel good inside. I feel good from the inside out. So in the yoga tradition, we're trying to draw our attention back in and move from the heart space outside rather than this constant. It's constant. We live in such a material world. Um, and so uh, I didn't mention for brahmacharya, but the brahmachari, if you if you hold your energy, then you have um, more. It's more nourishing for you, so not to dissipate your energy. Just back to brahmacharya for a minute. It's not necessarily relevant to all of us in the room, but for those that are um, you know single and not in relationships, it's also being very conscious about what sexual relationships you take part in. So it's said that the the once the male phallus enters the yoni, which is the female space, the karma of the male is, is there now for seven years. So you want to be very selective with who you're allowing into your sacred temple. The yoni translation, which is the vagina in this tradition, is the sacred temple. So you want to be very conscious about that. It's bringing consciousness to every single <coughs> level. So that's just a note for the single girls, for all the <laughs> single ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, I mean, you know, it's not nourishing for yourself if you sleep around and it doesn't feel good. So it's uh, just a, a little note. Um, and then for the, the freedom from back to the desires, you know, it's, fr it's freeing not to need anything, not to go out, not to have to buy anything, to just have a look and admire something because it's beautiful. So, um, you know, to too. it applies <laughs> to online shopping too, <laughs> <laughs> even on yoga websites <laughs> or um, aromatherapy. <laughs> I mean, of course, we l we're not, I'm not saying you have to get rid of everything. I, th I do think that, that your life and the stuff that you have represents a lot of your headspace. So if you tend to accumulate a lot and hoard a lot, then it's probably some clearing out of the mind space that needs to happen as well. I do think that that correlates. And of course, if you have less, it's life is easier. You have less clothes to choose from here, so it's much easier to make a decision. Um, so it is freeing, all of that. <laughs> You'll get used to the nature. <laughs> I'm glad we're learning about Shakti today. I have to put my, sun my glasses back on. So in, in Sanskrit, being the traditional language, there's not much difference between yama <coughs> and niyama. It just it adds a tiny little spin to put the ni before the yama. So it's sort of discipline and then discipline, but in a slightly different way. So they are all disciplines. But if you were only to take away two things from today, it would be do no harm, live gently. You know, live gently and tell the truth. Be truthful with yourself. They're the main two premises for all of yoga. If we move on to the, the sort of the recommendations, I would say, the niyamas, um, things that would be great if you could do. Things like um, shaucha. So sometimes when it's an essay, it depends on Sanskrit, it's pronounced sh. So shavasana, that's spelt S-A, is shavasana, with a sh sound. It's hard to know unless you've seen the transliteration. But shaucha is, um, the traditional translation is cleanliness or purity. So you'll hear um, the Indians talk a lot about purification, 
like um, burning away, purifying water, using water, using all of the five elements that the yoga teacher talked about this morning. Um, so they're all really important things in, um, in allowing ourselves to be as clean a base as possible to take in all of these new things and, and trying to reprogram our minds to think in a more positive way and to be more uh, conscious in the way that we choose things in our life. So shaucha is the first one. Uh, Simon's called that remove the obstacles. So you, can, you know what you're doing in your life that's not helping, I'm sure. You know, the things that are really like getting in the way, whether it's drinking too much wine or partying or, you know, something more simple like um, watching too much television and, and just distracting yourself from your thoughts because you don't want to be with your thoughts. So it can be anything but purifying um, your environment, your body. So here we're doing it in a holistic way. We're learning about these things so that we have more attention to what, how we will live. We're purifying through what we're drinking and what we're eating. We're being purified by these beautiful therapists that will do it for us with all of these techniques. And um, yeah, so it's, it's um, there's never one answer to any of this. And that's why with, with in Sanskrit in particular, it's never really able to be translated as one word. So it needs to be embodied. So these are the types of things, particularly when you become yoga teachers, that you kind of sit with for a really long time. Um, and I believe that the best teachers embody what they're talking about, and that's what you connect to. You connect to the fact that they've really understood it and got it, um, rather than them just parroting, yes, you need to be pure and clean. Because what does that mean? You know, in this tradition, I, I'm menstruating at the moment and it's the beginning. So I shouldn't have been in puja in this, this morning because, and I shouldn't be sitting in this room. So <laughs> because I'm talking about the Indian tradition of menstruating um, because it's impure. So as far as they're thinking, it can be considered impure. But more to the point, I should be resting. Mm -hmm in this time. And we'll talk about it uh, later in the week in another session. But um, So this purity thing is very big here. If you have questions on, and things to add, please just stop along the way. Santosha, super, uh, s super easy. This one really is contentment. So once we, once we start to live more gently and we're free from needing more stuff and, and um, once we have more integrity with our sexuality and what we put into our bodies and nourishment, then we just naturally become more content with who we are. We feel more full, we're more content, and there's less need for even, I dare say, conversations. Sometimes, you know, sometimes the desire is more just to be, just to have the time. I, I know that that's the only thing I struggle with in retreats is that I don't have as much time to sit with myself as I normally do. So that's why sometimes I disappear to my room or something so I can just regroup because that feeling of just being, just being, which we don't do very well as women, just to be. Because we think, okay, what's next? What do we need to do next? So what time is it? Yep, what's on next? Instead of, okay, there's half an hour. I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going to read a book or fill it with anything so hopefully by the end of the week you'll do more of that just sit and watch the monkey <laughs> or whatever it was the creature <laughs> two, monkeys. <laughs> two monkeys and so for Simon he says that's happiness you know if you're content with who you are and, and you know I, I'm already enough whatever money I have in the bank is enough whatever things I have is enough wherever I am in this moment is enough I don't need anything else. I'm already happy. I'm filled up from the inside. It's fleeting. It comes and goes. It's not something that stays with you all the time. But it, all of these things are trying to encourage them to stay longer and longer as things shed away. And none of this, um, you know, like uh, 10 years ago, I was a smoker. And uh, five years ago, I, I think I probably, I definitely used alcohol as some sort of a um, mechanism to feel good about myself or just to forget about all of the bad things that were apparently happening to me. 
So uh, with Panchakarma, I learned about the toxicity of alcohol and I just never drank again. So that was a big change. <laughs> so these things, it's not like they just all go at once. So you can't be hard on yourself and say, oh my God, I've got all this stuff. I have to fix everything. And then you fall off the wagon the next day and then you beat yourself up and then you're just back to square one. It's like they just naturally go. They it's lifetime. Yeah, it's lifetime. Yeah. Or maybe lifetimes, lifetime. I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, the fact that we're... It's, it's difficult if you don't subscribe to reincarnation to understand some of this stuff because a lot of it is based on that premise that we do come back again and again. But already that we're sitting in this circle in South India talking about this stuff means that we've karmically already been brought to this before. So it's not the first time you're studying this stuff. It's, it's, there's a reason why we're all here together, why we're this combination of personalities. And um, yeah, it's, we've been brought together for that reason. So, Santosha Tapas. <laughs> tapas is um, discipline or a zeal for yoga, but also a, a fire. So the tapas is like this, I don't know whether it's the same with any of the other yoga teachers, but. I didn't plan to become a yoga teacher. I just, mm -hmm. I just, you know, was going to a lot of classes and I knew that I loved it. And I knew that when I went in, when I, when I came out from when I went in, I was feeling amazing and I didn't really know why. And so I just did a training in order to, um, my first training, in order to know more. I wanted to know more. Like, like I just wanted to get into it more, give me more. And that, that's, that, that's the passion, the fire, the fire in your belly to like learn more about something. You know, when you're really into something, that's the tapas. The tapas can also be the discipline of practicing. So to f our 20 minute meditation is also a tapas. So that's, a, it's like, a, it can be called a sadhana, but another word for it is a, it's a tapas. So it's a, a discipline that you choose. So you can choose a tapas for yourself that you, and you give yourself a time frame and what you're going to do, how long you're going to do it for. So for this, we're doing 20 minutes of medit mantra meditation for 10 days or nine days. Um, and then I'll talk after the retreat about how long you could do practices for. Uh, does anyone else want to add to that? Like the, the stories of, you know, desiring to, it, it's passion. Mm -hmm. It's passion. It comes and from somewhere. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I think it doesn't matter how long or how many courses or how many retreats you go to, you're never satisfied. No. Because it, even though you've heard a lot of it before, you always come away with a different perspective on it. Um, and then you discover something else and you think, I want to know more about that. Yeah. And then you go on and you learn about that. So it is life mm -hmm. definitely. And teaching children yoga, you can pick the ones that have stuck being yogis in their own lives. <laughs> yeah. They are just incredible. Yeah. And the knowledge that comes out of their mouth yeah. and their ability to automatically sit in stillness That's is overwhelming. Yeah. Kids as young as three. Wow. And you think, oh my goodness. And it gives you an idea of how they pick the Dalai Lama. Mm. Yeah, mm. Because you go, wow, wow, I get that. Yeah. yeah. And, and they're amazing. Yeah. And they're really like souls. And you'll say something to them or ask them a question, well, what do you think about this or how do you see this? And their answers are incredibly wise. Yeah. So it is like this. Without the filters of our experience that we've grown up, you know, that we have yeah. as adults. Yeah, the purity, they have the purity, they have the shelter. Yeah, it's beautiful. The Dalai Lama is a tantric, by the way. Sorry? The Dalai Lama is a tantric. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so tapas is the passion. So, you know, I, I, I already think everyone must have that because you've signed up for a yoga retreat in India. <laughs> so you have to have had enough tapas and you must be into yoga enough to get yourself here. Yeah? So in such an extreme environment. <laughs> uh, the next one is a really big one and I referenced it in our first meeting together. Svadhyaya, sva meaning the self, the study of the self is like the way in. So we can't, we can't really change, transform, heal anything unless we know. We need to, 
you know, we're, we're human beings, so we have this thirst to intellectually know. So in the traditions, Vajraya can mean to study the Sanskrit texts as well. So like the, um, the second puja this morning, he would have been studying that Sanskrit for a long time and he still struggles over some bits, but he'll just continue and continue and continue. He doesn't necessarily know it all off by heart yet, but he's reading and studying and reading and studying, which is why I always say, first and foremost, I'm a student, not a teacher. So as people that share yoga, they should also be sh uh, learning yoga and con continuously studying. Most of my um, knowledge about yogic philosophy is from my own studies, not necessarily from, te well, teachers maybe have written the books, but not necessarily from trainings and things. So Svadhyaya is very important, that inner quest, you know, the, the thirst to know who you really are. Beyond, as one of my teachers says, this meat suit, which it is. You know, my meat suit looks like this, yours looks like that. Actually, you're not going to have that meat suit for that long. We're really here for such a short amount of time in the scheme of things. Um, so really understanding that there's a lot that we are that's beyond the meat suit. Um, and the meat suit doesn't reincarnate. The meat suit just <laughs> lays on the ground. Yeah, and it's the soul that we're trying to understand a bit of that that's the one that reincarnates. So understanding the soul also is the key to unlocking your inner purpose, a gift that you've been given to share in this life that often is eludes most people. Yeah. You know when you're in it, because it, everything flows. So that's part of the inner quest, finding what you should be doing in this life. It might be doing, might be what you're doing right now, and it may not be. And not being afraid to be able to maybe change at any age the trajectory of your life. To feel that power that we do have the opportunity to look and to search and to change, if we wish to. Ishvara Pranidhana is the surrender to the surrender, what's he said, to the higher self? Yeah, surrender. So, so you have to understand enough inquiry, self inquiry as to what that higher self is. And then you get to a stage where you just say, Guide me. Show me the way. Show me what I need to do. Show me what my gift is. Show me how I need to change my life and, and to make, you know, show me how I can serve others in a better way. Show me how I can be a better person. Show me how I can be more loving. You're surrendering to something greater than yourself. The literal translation is surrender to God. But we have so much stigma in our society of God, yeah? Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, I was brought up Catholic. The, the God in, the, in Catholicism, it's two kind of key words in the yogic tradition. It's non-dual and dual. So it's a dual philosophy, something like Catholicism, because God is out there, something different to you, and you're just a regular person that's really not, you know, has a lot of faults and needs to um, fix yourself that kind of thinking. Non-dual philosophy, which I think I often think it sounds confusing, but non-dual means one. So that's not necessarily that it's out there external to you. It's in you and it's also of you and around you. So it's, um, it's that, that all of these trees, this room, the other people that you see, everyone is that divine light walking around. As a little aside, I don't know whether you've noticed when everyone says namaste to you, if they, they either, if they can, they'll put, do prayer position, but if they can't, they'll put their hand on their heart. So it's like this recognition, I see you as God. It's actually what they're saying, you know, they, I bow down to you. I acknowledge I am that too, and I see it in you. It's very beautiful. Yeah. So loving connections, I think if we boiled down everything that everybody wants in life, it would come down to wanting to feel connected. 
to ourselves, to each other, to our partners, to potential partners, to our families, to feel connected and to feel love. It's, it's kind of as simple as that, but as complex as that. Um, it's complex in our society mm. because it's such a competitive society where we see each other separate and everything is compared to Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, we associate, think about relationships with men, for example, you know, we associate it with gifts and love with gifts and um, words and requiring that they treat us or say things or adore us in a certain way in order for us to feel loved rather than us internally generating love and emanating love and love just coming to us because that's what we are. So really the ultimate, you know, it would be amazing if we could all become enlightened but I think even greater than that is that to realise that we are fully loved and supported all of the time. I know that for my own personal life, everything shifted when I understood that. When I started to think, when I started to understand, not even, so it's not thinking's not really involved, but when I realized that I was always loved and supported within myself and within my belief system of, of everything being divine, that yes, beautiful to in, choose to engage in a relationship, but I no longer need that in order to feel loved because I already am love. So it's a little bit of a difference in the in the thinking, um, but yeah, it's super interesting. How to get onto that? Yeah, Ishvara Pranidhana. <laughs> so as you can see, we haven't even got to asana yet. So we've just said all of that, which is huge, right? So that's all of those those ten things are the foundation of philosophy of all yoga, and then we suggest that maybe doing some asana would also help. So if you do all of that other stuff and then you'd start to work on your body. So we haven't looked at working on the body yet. So the next step would be to work on the body. So ideally yoga is to have a nimble, healthy body that is able to sit comfortably in meditation because without being able to sit still with a straight spine, we won't be able to realize that we are love. And, um, and to be able to have no um, stagnant areas or blockages in the body. So, so doing the postures is simply blocking areas and then releasing them and allowing free flow of blood and prana in order for the energy to free run freely. So um, even though it is officially yoga, it's kind of anything huffing and puffing where you're struggling, you're not really going to get the benefits of the energetic unblockages because you're struggling. So they say sukha stira masana. I mean, this, the postures should be um, sweet and strong, smooth and easeful. So you should, it's not easy to be in some of these postures, right? But your breath shouldn't be, um, your breath usually tells you. So yes, it takes years sometimes to get postures and then sometimes your body's just not built for certain things. Um, and that's also part of the yoga. So you know what, I'm never going to do a headstand. It's fine, my, el my arm length is not enough and I'm always going to hurt my neck if I do headstands. Actually, that's my category and I've struggled and hurt my neck for many years till I realized that. Um, yeah, so asana, it, it's the most common misunderstanding in the West of what yoga is, is that it's just physical. But also, as you see with the doctors, physical is also super important. We're walking around in these meat suits. We want to keep them as healthy as possible. So um, we don't want stagnant energy. So a, a, a balanced um, yoga practice where you do begin to build strength and you can ma maintain it for the rest of your life, that's the type of yoga you want to be doing. Not the type of yoga that you can only do now but in two years time because you've had so many injuries you can't do yoga anymore. So you want this sustainable 
type of yoga that is going to get you through the rest of your life. You know, I can't imagine not doing yoga for the rest of my life. I don't know about you guys. But um, yeah, so that's where asana comes. So it really comes quite far down the track after all of the other base principles. And then after asana comes pranayama. So in the tradition in India, they don't teach breathing exercises until after you've got a good basis of all of the yamas and niyamas and then a basic understanding, like a, a good solid uh, practice of physical asana. And here it's not, uh, even though now you'll see some Indians doing um, like some of the tricky poses, like say a scorpion pose or something, that's not the normal yoga that people are doing in the parks in Delhi. So what they're doing is they're doing, um, you know, they're doing sun salutations, they're doing breathing exercises, they're sitting in meditation. So it's very simple. They're, they're doing something that lifts up their heart rate and then they're laying down in Shavasana and receiving the benefits of the pose. Then they're getting up again and they're doing something else. So it's quite different um, to some of the yoga that we have. Pranayama, we've already started to learn, Nadi Shodhana. And um, I'm sure that Rakesh will teach a few different things as well and that you already have some things that you've done before. There's lots of different types of pranayama. Um, does everyone have an understanding of what prana is? Prana? We're only getting a few head nods. <laughs> so just briefly, prana is prana is the it's the life force of the body. It's 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 what leaves when a body dies. So it's what animates you, what makes you human. So you could say, yes, that's the beating heart, but it's not really, because your heart can be beating, but you're not there, right? So it's the, it's, it's the life force that makes you, you. And it's a, an energy that is, um, that is often referred to in yoga. It's what we're, we're talking about when we're in postures and we're releasing blockages, we're releasing pranic blockages, not, not necessarily physical blockages, which is sometimes hard to get your head around. And um, it's... Pranic blockages create? Yes, and then they cause disease and your cancers and all of your bits and pieces. Um, also, emotion, holding on to emotions that we haven't identified does the same thing. So, yeah, prana, prana is essential. We could say that it runs through the nerve system, it's, but it's not exactly correct. But that's probably for our, men, for our minds to be able to understand what it is. That's the closest that we could say. Because say, when we're getting acupuncture, they releasing, they call it chi, it's prana, prana chi, it's the same, it's interchangeable in the Chinese tradition, Indian traditions. So they're, ta they're actually, it's on a nerve line. So they actually, it is, it does look like the nerve system, but it's something greater than that because we are greater than our, ener our energy is greater than our physical meat suit bodies. So that's why it's, it's bigger than that, but the easiest way to understand it is that you could say that it goes through the nerve channels um, and those nerve channels are called nadis in this tradition. And then the central, you could say that, that in order to get enlightenment, it needs to go through the spinal cord, essentially. But it's, it's greater than that, but that's how we can understand it intellectually. Uh, so then we're moving up the tree. Pratyahara is uh, super important. So it's a withdrawal of the senses you can simply do it by closing your eyes. You're already withdrawing one of your senses. So we have the five senses. The doctors will talk about it. It gets referenced a lot in rituals. The five senses are what keep us from being staying in here. So all of our senses are what keep our focus out there all the time. So that's why it's so hard to sit here and concentrate because we can see things, we can hear things, we can, it feels hot. You know, we've got all of these senses going, and then there's the funny smell, or there's the fire smell from this morning. Like, there's so much going on all of the mm -hmm. time. So 
what uh, Ayurveda Tantra Yoga teach us is that we need to get a hold of the senses in order to be able to, to get a grasp of any of this stuff. So we, uh, that's why we always is we try to close our eyes when we practice, whenever you can, because it brings the senses, at least the eyes, inside. And um, we try to practice silence as much as we can when we practice yoga because it brings the, the listening ears can relax. So that's um, controlling the senses. It'll come up a lot, but it's also... Um, it's also what feeds the mindscape as well and understanding that we are beyond our thoughts is a big part of um, being able to understand the, th the self. I'll keep moving. Any questions? I was just um, with the Pramakamaras with the Vajra <coughs> and the Akhenai meditation. Mm. Have you done that? I don't think I've... A f uh, I've done some in the tantric tradition. I understand why, um, and that's because they have already trained their senses enough to have their op their eyes open. So um, it's to be able to be in this center, but in this world, and that's very tantric as well. So I am, I am in my center. I am. At I am content with who I am, but I am running this, and yes. I'm yeah. So it's this kind of dual thing. Yes. Yeah, it's not so easy for beginners because you you you've already you know you it's stimulation. It's 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 unfortunate now in all of the great things of the technology that we just we're just unable to concentrate so badly because mm. of this overstimulation with phone phones and um, iPads and things. So, um, yeah, the Brahma Kumaris are often living like these ladies. Oh, you didn't see them. We, we ran into some Brahma Kumari ladies in Kochi. Yeah. We oh, had some you? photos with them. Yeah, and they invited us to their center. Yeah, they yeah, yeah just near the here, airport. Yeah. 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 And um, they're, you know, you meet them and they're very at peace with who they are. They're all wearing white saris. And I said, oh, can we go take a photo of them? And they introduce themselves as a group of Brahma Kumaris. But um, yeah, it, they're living in an ashram environment and, and they're already minimizing their senses. They're, not, they're already practicing freedom from desire. They don't need anything. They live a very simple life. So um, I think it's very beneficial, but I just don't think it's that it's not a step, easy stepping stone for a beginner. Mm. It's easier to shut down the senses first, mm. get a sense of the inner world, and then maybe introduce that later on. Mm. Yeah. Pratyahara number five, six, dharana. So it, it's exactly as I just said, dharana is um, concentration. So you can't meditate unless you can learn to concentrate. And our biggest challenge as shakti women female energy is that we can't concentrate very well. How many of you like to multitask? <laughs> like, That's um, what we were designed to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. We, we create, <laughs> well, we create it. We, this <laughs> nature is a traditional thing. Like, that's Shakti. Like, look at it. It's wild. You know, that's what we are. We're wild. We can make, we can grow babies in our bodies and create life. It's incredible. Um, but sticking, staying on point from one mm. thing and just staying with that for, a, for enough time to be able to realize who we are is, is difficult. But I anyway, in the tantric tradition, we're already gifted because we already have this amazing uh, ability to create life. So we'll talk about that more in a sec. And uh, so, so you have to have this... Um, you have to have a base of concentration before you can meditate. You have to be able to sit and focus on something. All techniques that you would have been exposed to before now probably weren't just sitting there and not having anything to think, like nothing to focus on. There's always something. The most um, common would be the breath. So at the very least, you normally would concentrate on your breath. Or you might have tried candle gazing meditation, so to concentrate on the flame, 
or you can concentrate on an object, you can sit and meditate on a tree, you know, something that's still, not moving, which would be still. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so there's all of the, the different techniques that you're exposed to with different teachers or listening to guided meditations are all meditation, concentration techniques. So concentrating your mind because it's naturally taking in all the time. How many times, I don't know, how, how many times have you sat down to meditate and then just, there's just, there's some, you know, like, oh, there's this thing, there's, oh, there's a hair, you know, there's, there's always something. And it's usually to do with the physical world, you know, or actually I, in saying that, or your mind is going, nah, 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 this, this, but I've got to get, do, I, can't, I don't have time for meditation, but I really need to do it because I'm better when I meditate, you know, this, this conversation that's constantly going on in our, in our heads. Um, and then, you know, once, you've, once you're able to concentrate, once you can train yourself to concentrate on one point or one task, you'll find that you become so much more efficient and that, that time expands, not just in meditation, but also in life. Mm -hmm. So um, it's actually a bit of a myth that, that multitasking is beneficial. And um, really, I mean, I know for myself that if, I, if I'm focused on one thing and I do it properly, I really, I had this rule from living in Vietnam many years ago <laughs> that do one thing a day, get one thing done. It was because it was a su it's, it's equally as challenging as India. It was a super challenging environment to live in. It was like, if I can get one thing a day done, then I'm happy. And it's still something that I kind of live by now. Um, so then you can move on to meditation. And meditation is beyond that point. So it's a point where it's hard to put into words, but where you're in some way, your, mi your mind and your body drop away from your experience of yourself. Does that it make any sense? So you just become the awareness that's sitting there rather than the observer of what's happening rather than Belinda, me sitting in meditation and knowing that I'm fe I can feel my body. There's a point where you, and some of you might have had good experiences of it or it's like fleeting experiences of it where, where it just everything drops away and you don't notice the time and it was and 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 um, your mind became still, still enough, spacious enough. I, I have to say now, when I meditate, it's, it's, it's not always, like, it's definitely not always like that, but the thoughts are like over in those corners, unless something's really going on for me and it's really, it's really churning me up. But they're, they're, they're enough away from you that they don't bother you. So there's never no thoughts. That's a myth in meditation. You don't have to stop thinking. It's impossible to do that. Because if, it's as ba if you think about it as basic as um, thoughts that are just squibs of energy, like any other energy in your body, then the, there's always the brain is it's, it's electric. So there's always going to be thoughts happening. But it's your, dis your cho conscious choice of how you interact with those thoughts. And the more you do these base things, the more the space becomes clear. It just it clears it out on your behalf. Um, and I, I believe years of practice also help. Like it's not, it's not something that you can just, actually there are examples, there are many examples of people who spontaneously become enlightened, but it's not the norm. Mm -hmm. Everybody else works, bloody hard <laughs> yeah exactly and then it's their turn that next time um, and that so so you get on to dhyana which is meditation and uh, so the state of being uh, being without your mind and your body and observing who you are beyond that and then samadhi is like a complete um, Well, I would say actually there's a fine line between that, that explanation and that that is samadhi almost. So that time where you're able to lose track of everything, and I'm not talking falling asleep, like still being fully conscious, fully aware, fully relaxed, 
but your body drops away, your mind drops away, and you lose your sense of time, then I would say you're getting a glimpse of what samadhi is, and samadhi is enlightenment. So you're getting a glimpse of what an awakened state is. And some people receive that and walk around in the world living that. Um, someone like uh, Amaji, has anyone heard mm. of the Hugging Saint? Mm -hmm. Beautiful Carolyn woman, actually. Mm. I was lucky enough to be here at that time last year and she was in the town close to here. I received a hug from her and she is, um, there's a few saintly people like that that just embody an awakened state but she still is meditating every day and her, um, her practice is seva which is selfless service. So she just has an abundance of love to give mm. and so you go there and it does something to you. you know, I I went in for the hug and she whispered mantras in my ear and and then you know everything was over in a flash and I, I, I walked away and I started laughing and then I started crying and I had no control over what was happening and um, it was that she she was karmically balancing out whatever negativities um, were in me, they just got balanced out by her state of being. She's in an awakened state. So, you know, I think that we all want to wake up a little more, yeah? We all want to become a little more conscious. We're drawn to this stuff. It's interesting. It's, it's interesting to be able to make a more conscious decision in your life that's going to make you feel more content and more happy and, and feel like you have more loving connections. I think they're really desirable things. It's not out of this world to want those things. I think having a glimpse of an awakened life is totally possible, yeah? So that's the idea of the eight limbs of yoga. And I'm just, um, I'll just read um, Simon's two definitions because he puts all of the words of the yamas and niyamas together and two definitions of yoga and I think it's really beautiful. He says, yoga is the gentle balanced giving of nourishment and freedom and yoga is the passionate inner quest to remove the obstacles of, un of happiness and loving connection. I would always say remove the obstacles of unhappiness and, and receive loving connection, be in loving connection more often. So um, that's a basis of what, you know, what most yogis are about, the principles. And that's what I would like us to try and, you know, follow while we're here together. Particularly, you know, the non-violence and thoughts and action, and um, and being truthful because you can't you can't heal and transform anything unless you're truthful with what's really going on. So not I know it's very very hard, especially you don't really know everybody, and sharing things in circle can be really confronting and. Um, sharing things with these <laughs> random doctors in the bush in Kerala is maybe, um, you know, it's, you have to be vulnerable to share what's going on, but it's the only place to start is to identify and be truthful for with what's going on, whatever you can actually articulate, because sometimes you just don't really know. And that's where people like these doctors can help you find out those answers. Um, mm. Yeah. So that's the eight limbs of yoga.